Hello, everyone. This is another episode of the Unisoft Law YouTube show, which I now refer to as the Unisoft question. I'm trying out different names for the show. And let me know if you have any comments on, uh, on this new name. We always have interesting guests. Today, I have a really interesting guest that I have so many questions for. Uh, his name is Gary Kalatsi. Uh, he is the CEO of Alexa Translations, and he's also a lawyer. I uh, don't want to take any more time, and I just want to pass the floor to Gary and uh, uh, let him introduce himself. Hello, Gary. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Pilat. It's uh, exciting. I've been watching uh, your, uh, all your previous uh, sessions, so I'm glad that I'm uh, on the list. Of course you are. You are one of the people that really interest me. And you know what? When I was scrolling through your LinkedIn profile, there are so many accomplishments. There are so many uh, appointments and uh, uh, tenures and uh, projects. But at the very end, something really impressed me. Uh, seven languages? <laughs> really? <laughs> wow. So let me go through the list. I, I love this in people. I'm also into languages, of course. Uh, and uh, let me go through the list. So Albanian, which is your mother tongue, right? That's right. Your first so, language. And then English, who would have thought? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> who would have thought? <laughs> exactly, like, right? A lawyer in Ontario. So, and then French, uh, comment on that? Brief comment. So before I actually, uh, before moving to Canada and, and I was 17 when I came to Canada, the, uh, I said, I'm actually, you know, my parents made, made that decision. I said, okay, well, I'll be uh, moving to a country that's bilingual. I better start learning some French. So I went to the, the Alliance Francaise and started uh, maybe about four months only to realize that coming to Ontario I don't use French daily or I wouldn't uh, be, you know, even going to high school. I was like, none of you guys uh, really speak French with each other. I guess <laughs> that's normal. And only to then uh, go and do uh, spend a summer in Quebec to, to truly do an immersion. <laughs> you know, this is so interesting. Uh, we apparently have a lot in common. I also learned French at Alliance Francaise. Uh, I understand you went to an Alliance Francaise branch in Albania, though, right? That's right. That's right. So I went to um, an Alliance Francaise branch at the Spadina and Bloor. <laughs> and, but I also went to the French immersion program when I was in law school. So when I was at Osgood, uh, after my first year, I went to a very small town in Quebec called Jonquière. And I spent five weeks. Is this the program, the Explore program? I think it was no, called. That's it. I, I did that in Trois Same, same concept. <laughs> C'est génial. Uh, I'm very happy that we have this program. It really helped me a lot. And then uh, the next language is Deutsch. Sprechen yeah, so, Sie Deutsch? Yeah, aber uh, nicht sehr gut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know the. Warum? The Warum? <laughs> the Warum? With well, Varum, exactly. The, the trouble is that uh, I actually made quite a bit of progress before coming to Canada and then mm -hmm. for the last 20 years, I just haven't used it all that much. Mm -hmm. so the trouble yeah. with languages is that, you know, the, the theory is you lose about 25% of what you know uh -huh. every year you don't use it. Uh, so you never go to zero, but 25% of what you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, as time goes on, you end up losing it. And uh, I've been to Germany a few times since uh, I moved to Canada, but you know, how much do you use it when you show up to a country for a few days, right? So. German might not be so popular in North America, but it's quite popular in Europe, correct me if That's I'm right. wrong, because right. Germany is so important in Europe. Exactly. And uh, Greek. Yeah, so I was born right by the border with Greece in Albania. So that was, Greek was actually the first foreign language I learned. Um, wow. And, uh, the it's also the only language from the list of languages that has a different alphabet so uh, mm -hmm. took a bit more effort as you can imagine too because now you have to learn a different alphabet altogether so right. i enjoy greek and uh, i have family that lives in greece and uh, i go there often that's amazing and the greek alphabet uh, i think is the father of the cyrillic alphabet which exactly. is the alphabet of my first language 
I will let the audience guess what my first language is. <laughs> I know I have an accent. They can figure it out. I gave enough clues. <laughs> and then the next one is Italian. Yeah, so Italian became uh, almost a proximity piece, uh, much like Greek, but also watch, as a kid watching a lot of Italian television, you know, before I was uh, maybe in till about grade three, grade four. Grade four, I actually started studying it formally and I did for about 10 years, even did it in university here. So when I became a court interpreter in, in uh, Canada, uh, I got certified for Albanian, but I used to do Italian as well. Wow, so you speak Italian at a level sufficient to be a court interpreter. At least I used to. <laughs> it's been yeah, about 10 course. years now that I haven't yeah. been doing uh, yes. Uh, yes. Well, this appearance. is very inspiring, very inspiring. Uh, and then finally, Spanish. What's the story? So Spanish was more for, for the fun and the passion. You're in North America, you're surrounded by Spanish a lot more than you were, uh, you know, to some extent in Europe, but certainly more here. And uh, being that it's a Latin language, uh, Italian and French have helped with it. And uh, I still have a lot more work to do on Spanish. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Yeah, so do I. I also uh, want to learn Spanish uh, after my uh, trip to Barcelona, but uh, I actually spoke uh, um, uh, Catalan uh, in Barcelona. I, tr I started learning Catalan. I, I wish it was a, a funny story and I wish I could say it was, I started learning Catalan by mistake, <laughs> but I intended to learn uh, Spanish instead. No, I actually wanted to learn Catalan. Uh, so, with this background, which sounds like uh, a very uh, language-oriented background, uh, humanities-oriented background, you end up in uh, University of Windsor in the Bachelor of Science program. What did you actually study there and why? So I was in the biochemistry program um, because I was considering going into medicine. Uh, Ah. Despite enjoying languages throughout university, I did really well at sciences. My father is a pharmacist, uh, so there was this affinity to the health sciences. Uh, you know, and because I did well in them, I thought I guess I should do, <laughs> I should do medicine. You know, um, and it wasn't until uh, the summer uh, between high school and university is when I got certified as a court interpreter. So I used to start getting all this court exposure. And that's when I started thinking, maybe I enjoy it a lot more. <laughs> uh -huh. Is this the story of how you ended, uh, ended up going to law school? Because you uh, uh, worked as a court interpreter as a, as a young person. Exactly. Uh, the, and after second year of undergrad uh, in biochemistry, I started my original translations company. Back then it was called Kalatsi Translations. <laughs> Kalatsi so then Translations. I realized... I realized that maybe I shouldn't be going to, I shouldn't be in science and medicine after all, I should do law and business because I seem to enjoy this court exposure and I seem to enjoy the business side of things. Uh, I, want to, I want to draw everyone's attention to when you started your company, which you are the CEO of, and which is called Alexa Translations today. You started in August 2002, 18 years ago. That's Speaking right. of things that last, <laughs> right? So you started that company when? When you were uh, in your undergrad? That's right. That's right. Uh, in your chemistry program, correct? That's, that's right. Uh, and it was, and it, as I was working as a court interpreter, I said, oh, I think there's an opportunity here. So you started this company as a one-man shop, basically selling your own services. And it's nothing like that today, of course. Absolutely <laughs> nothing. It's, 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 it's a global conglomerate today. We'll talk about that. So, um, so you went to law school after you were exposed to the courts. What did you see at the courts? Like what made you decide to be a lawyer? What terrible things did you see there? <laughs> well, I, the exposure were, was largely criminal and civil litigation mm -hmm. because as an interpreter, that's largely what you're doing. Um, some uh, some immigration cases, um, a lot of exposure uh, with the uh, Canada Border Services immigration because um, you will find both. Uh, being in Windsor, you're also at the border as well. So a lot of interesting so immigration law, criminal law, civil law, 
and a lot of interesting aspects. And I said, you know, I think I like, and I was also volunteering at a hospital at the time. So I started sort of getting exposure to both sides of the equation. And I'm like, which one do I like better? <laughs> And there seemed to be more affinity to, to the courts, despite, to your point, not everything is all fun. And like what you see on the law shows, like Harvey showing up and saying, this is why we should win this case. And <laughs> mm -hmm. not everything is, uh, you know, not everything is the, the way we experience them in the law shows that we see on TV. You know, I, I also find that we, we have that in common because I decided to be a litigator only after I actually went to court rooms and observed proceedings. Law school itself gave me absolutely no idea what I wanted to be as a lawyer. It's, it's only after getting some uh, pra practical experience that I decided definitely that I wanted to be a litigator. So you decided to go to law school. You went to law school in Windsor. You started in 2005 and uh, you did a joint uh, law and MBA program, right? That's right. So why, why did you decide to do a joint law uh, and MBA program? Were you hedging your bets? <laughs> Were you not sure about law as a career? No, no it was actually, uh, you know, as I started the business uh, in undergrad, I, I actually realized I had no formal business training. I mean, I had good math skills because being in the sciences, but to be running a business is not just good math skills. <laughs> Eastern Europe and math skills. Tell me about it. I, I know that story. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the thinking was uh, that, you know, for an extra year to get an MBA, it, it, you also have a master's level program because let's not forget law is still a bachelor's despite being uh, a, a professional degree. And so I said, this makes a lot of sense. I get some business training in the process and perhaps I can do corporate law because that sets you up nicely for it. I was also considering IP law because, again, undergrad being in, in biochemistry, you're well suited to, uh, to be doing IP law as well. So you finished your law school uh, or the joint law MBA program uh, in 2009. That's By right. that time, you've had uh, Alexa translations uh, for seven years. That's right. How did your company evolve over, the, over that time, by the, by the time you finished law school? So uh, at, by the 2009, I was still doing some interpretations myself. And by the way, 2009 is when we, up until then was Kalazzi translations and the switch to Alexa happened then, which I have to tell you the story as to how we ended up with Alexa translations as well and no affiliation to Amazon uh, whatsoever. However, we had the name first. Uh, not that I'm positioning for litigation. Tell, tell us, tell us the story. Uh, I really want you to speak uh, as much as you, uh, as freely as you can, and tell us all the stories. That's what we're here for. So, uh, Colossal Translation make the move to Alexa Translations in 2009. I'm articling. I'm getting a lot of exposure to corporate law. Uh, worked with some great lawyers, uh, but what I realized during that process is that. I'm in a situation where I'm helping other entrepreneurs build businesses. And here I have a business on the side that I'm not paying enough attention to. I mean, everyone that's gone through article knows it's not exactly a time to run a side business. <laughs> uh, so as I got close to the bar, I had to make the decision of which way am I going? And, you know, once you call to the bar, you also have the flexibility. Okay, now you're a lawyer, so you can practice as much or as little as you choose. Uh, but this is the time to, if I'm going to give this business a real shot, this is the time to do it. So up until, you know, even through law school, et cetera, I wasn't doing as much interpretation or translation myself. I actually had a roster of uh, people that, that uh, we, I used to send for interpretations at courts, immigration, um, whether it was the, at the border or, or hearings, otherwise meetings with lawyers, et cetera. When 2010 came uh, and, and I would go to go to the bar, I said, okay, this is it. I need to do this for real. We got our first office in uh, January, 2011. In Jan January, 2011, uh, that was the, the, okay, now let's, let's build up something that uh, can really matter, like a real business. Mm -hmm. uh, where, and that was also the turning point where I stopped doing any interpretation translation myself. And I said, now it's just actually building up this business. And the, the impetus behind it was, 
I understood professional service as well, having been in those shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's cater to the professional service as well as we can. So it was things like providing uh, translation of documents for corporate transactions, for securities transactions, for um, all kinds of civil litigation cases, for IP matters, uh, financial services, marketing services, government work. So really going after a much broader space. And to this day, uh, we're now actually, French is, is by far the number one translation language and then Spanish and Chinese and any of the languages I do <laughs> or I used to do are somewhat irrelevant to our business now because they're, uh, mm -hmm. they're a much smaller component of, of our business. Mm -hmm. so, so in 2011, you made a strategic decision to grow Alexa translations as, as a business, as an entity separate from you. Is this when you incorporated it? Also, the incorporation was actually in 2009 because I had already made the decision that, you know, I, I need to grow it more and, and it shouldn't be just a sole proprietorship. Right. <laughs> but the, the, the growth and, and the, that's when we also thought of the name being Alexa Translations. What's the Alexa name story? And I know that Amazon came up with it, at least published it after you. So there's nothing, uh, you know, people have made jokes. Is that an ex-girlfriend? Is that, an, it's none of the above. We actually wanted something that had lexicum or lexicon as part of the, of the root. We also wanted something with the first two letters of the alphabet. So when you have alphabetical ranking, you're at the top of lists, right? So mm -hmm. anytime you go into a, a trade show, et cetera, we'd be at the top. So we said alexicum, alexicum. Uh, both versions sounded a little cumbersome and we shortened it to Alexa because it was easy to remember, easier to say. We tested in different languages, didn't mean anything that offensive. Uh, pretty much every culture we tested it with and then every language, uh, people speaking different languages had no trouble saying it. So we we're like, okay, it's a good name, it's catchy. We should uh, call it Alexa Translations. Uh, applied for our trademark in 2012, two years before Amazon did in Canada. <laughs> and uh, we have the trademark for it. Mm -hmm. How have your company grown from the early days to now? And uh, you can use any metric that you feel comfortable with, but it's, yeah. I really want to understand the difference between these two snapshots and how, how the company evolved. So uh, obviously since uh, 2010, we're over a hundred times bigger. And so, I mean, just the size wise, uh, in, you know, the, just in our, our core management uh, team right now, we're at over 40 people. So it's, 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 a, it's a def definitely a different organization than when, <laughs> when I was first doing it myself. Um, and part of the growth happened two years ago with an acquisition in the AI machine translation technology space, two and a half now. Uh, and the, what triggered the acquisition uh, was that human translation was great and we, we are, uh, one of the best in the country and, and one of the largest in the country. But we knew that AI was playing a bigger and bigger role. And I think to anyone listening, um, I mean, they would have noticed with Google three, four years ago, Google all of a sudden started getting much better. I mean, you go onto Facebook these days and you see translation in different languages. You're like, yeah, that's actually quite impressive for a machine. Um, and as we noticed that, we're like, okay, we either are going to play part in this or one day we may not have a business. <laughs> and we found a company that was uh, listed on the New York Stock Exchange over the counter. Uh, we uh, made the transaction and, and uh, there, we got them to go private before the transaction. And we're, we're now one and then they've been rebranded as Alexa Translations AI. And we now have traditional translation services as well as you can actually license our AI and machine translation technology. Does this signify a shift from being a services company to being a technology company or a product company? A hundred percent. I think the, there's a, a large portion of our organization now that is dedicated to just that. Uh, I mean, we have 10 programmers uh, in-house, uh, which is sizable for, for, uh, for, especially when it's something as narrow as, as dedicated to translation technology. 
And uh, the, the idea is that we, ha we have the only tool dedicated to the French Canadian market. Uh, mm -hmm. and we, we launched Spanish through it as well, Latin American Spanish, but really the core of it is French Canadian. So English to French, French to English. So any Canadian entity that needs high-end uh, French content, the, our tool is the best uh, way to go uh, for it. And we have, we run objective tests, et cetera. So this isn't just, me saying we have the best tool. Um, and we, so the organizations can, that have translation departments can license it. Lawyers that are doing due diligence on a file and have tens or hundreds of French documents can upload a document, translate it, maintain the formatting and get it within a minute or so. Um, and they can do that with a hundred documents at a time, right? Like no one could have imagined that even two, three years ago. But is the human translation and the services related to human translation uh, still the biggest part of your business? Or has it now been superseded by the technology side and the product side? It's still the biggest part of our business. Uh, the, it hasn't been superseded yet, but the projection is that it will be superseded uh, very soon. Wow, so this is very interesting. Uh, before I ask uh, questions about this, uh, compare the client profiles in uh, 2009 and now. How, how are they similar? How are they different? Well, in 2009, we used to still work even with a lot of individuals. So, uh, you know, Pulat said, I have uh, some documents that need to be translated into English from uh, from, uh, I, I won't actually give away your country because you challenged our viewers to, to, to figure it out. So <laughs> let's say from, from source language to English as a target language um, and it'd be like, no problem, you know, we'll get them prepared for you. You need to file them with, you know, say Canada Revenue Services um, or Canada Revenue Agency. Uh, the, uh, here's the, the translation with, along with the relevant declarations. Right now, it's rare that we work with individuals at all. Like it's uh, the it's all B two B, and with some of the largest institutions in Canada, some of the largest banks, uh, largest law firms, accounting firms, um, and um, energy companies, uh, consumer goods companies. Really, they're some of the largest brands, uh, and not just in Canada, in the world, actually. Right, and I assume the difference between. 2009 clients and 2020 clients is a volume and the expectation of quality, quality standards. So the stakes are much higher and you get much bigger projects and uh, standards are much higher than uh, 11 years ago, correct? All of that is correct. And uh, our errors in emissions insurance <laughs> reflects it accordingly. The magnitude we're required to have now because of sort of clients we have. Uh, versus what we had back then is very different. So I'm really curious about the ability of machine translation to meet that standard. You just described an extremely high standard and you just described a, a, your, your company's successful evolution from a run of the mill uh, translation shop uh, to uh, a corporate uh, provider of high-end translation services to high-stakes clients. Where does machine translation fit in there? And is it really good enough to meet that standard? So machine translation, cannot, you cannot put a prospectus or, or a statement of claim through machine translation, take it out of it and file it with the court or with the Securities Commission, etc. So machine will not provide you something that is client ready, so to speak. Machine will provide you something and, and what machine aims to be is to get to that over 90% accuracy rate. So you can get as close to human translation as possible. But uh, the whole point of the industry is let's make the translator's job as fast as possible, but not eliminate the translator. There's language evolves to too much. Uh, and a lot of it, a lot of the understanding and so on is, lies in the hands of the reader. So machine can do a really good job, but it will soon require human intervention, at least in the foreseeable future. I, I can't see a path where you eliminate a translator altogether. 
Right. So when you describe the technology side of your business, you uh, mentioned that you were licensing your technology or that you developed products based on your technology. Can you go into more detail about what exactly the technology side of your business sells and to whom? So the, the largest uh, buyers of our technology are some of Canada's largest law firms, accounting firms, financial institutions, uh, mining companies, insurance companies. Uh, and what they're doing is the internal translation departments are, or uh, bilingual users are saying, I'm going to use this, get the first draft, and then, then it'll make us more effective internally and, and faster. Um, so that translators don't actually have to do the boring job of doing everything from scratch and focusing more on the wordsmithing, which is what they enjoy anyway, right? It's almost like, you know, somebody could go to a litigator and say, this AI will generate a statement of claim for you that does some of the mundane stuff that you need to do anyway. And you just focus on the wording of some of the issues and some of the stuff that is really what matters to the statement of claim. And that's what the idea was behind this. It's like, let's generate the technology. You can API to all kinds of third parties resolvers, et cetera, of the world. Like any, you know, if you're doing due diligence, um, you could uh, API to trans what they call CAD tools, computer assisted translation tools that translators use. But our AI platform alone, you could upload uh, documents through it directly. So imagine a, a platform where you can upload a text uh, or sorry, you can copy and paste text the way you would have seen with a lot of the current tools, but also upload documents like a word PDF, Excel, PowerPoint, InDesign files, HTML files. This will translate it and maintain the formatting and get you something that is impressive in the quality of the format as well as the translation quality. Your company purchased this technology essentially and then evolved it in-house. Tell us more about that acquisition. So what are the origins of this technology? The, organ the predecessor organization was had very good technology, but it was focused on the e-commerce space, which meant that uh, any websites using it, this was translating 30 plus languages at a given time. Um, and what we found was the, you know, when you're competing, doing that many languages, you're actually competing with the Googles of the world and some of the companies that have resources that are immense, right? Um, mm -hmm. And we said, okay, we don't have the resource of Google but we have very specific knowledge in the legal financial marketplace where we could really have a tool that is amazing in this very narrow profile. Mm -hmm. Except that that narrow profile in a country like Canada that is bilingual means there's a lot of clients that benefit from it. Um, mm -hmm. So we specialize into Canadian French and then further specialize in legal and financial. So that's where it's the best, but even beyond legal financial we do really well compared to other tools. Like Gary, I had a, a few conversations with francophone lawyers uh, over the years, and I, I interviewed one recently. Um, I, I spoke with another one on the same show. <clears throat> and one of the things that came up was the, that there is a gap between French, uh, between uh, court decisions written in French and court decisions written in English. There's this whole body of law that was originally written in French in Canada, and it's our law. Just because it's written in French doesn't mean that it doesn't apply to us, right? And I'm not even, I'm not even talking about Quebec decisions necessarily. I'm talking about some of, of, of the Ontario Superior Court decisions, right? Uh, or even Ontario Court of Appeal decisions can be in French. There are whole regions in Ontario that are francophone that cater to francophone populations. So we talked about this gap, and some of uh, the, uh, some of our lawyers are fully bilingual, so they bridge that gap for themselves. And actually, differences in translation came up as legal arguments in some cases. Tell us about using your technology to solve this problem. And it's not only a one-way problem. It's not only translating from French into the language that we, the English speaking lawyers understand, but it's also uh, uh, translating this giant body of English language decisions into French to uh, actually accommodate the linguistic minority. W what do you think about this? 
So, uh, you know, it, it's a few different items in what you just said. So I'll dissect it one at a time so that we can approach. So certainly to your point, um, you know, within Ontario and, and uh, New Brunswick, et cetera, like uh, Alberta, BC, uh, we have Francophone communities throughout Canada, right? Sometimes we forget and we think of it as a, almost a Quebec regional uh, um, language and it's not, it's, you know, and even to your point within Ontario, I'm sure we have judges that are far more comfortable writing in their native language than maybe French. And, and I'm sure their English is great, but if you had a choice, they write in their language. And if they so choose to write it in French, they are able to, and as they should. And then uh, you would have this, to your point, great decisions uh, that are in French, but when we get the translation, yeah, the translator didn't fully understand the spirit behind it. And to, to really understand the spirit of a translation, you really need an understanding of the subject matter of the, the ongoing proceedings and sometimes even the intentions behind it. So it's almost like to actually translate the decision, you need to review all the materials that were submitted to the judge before the decision was made to actually have that level of context. Unfortunately, in translation, if we did that, it, translation becomes so expensive, right? And, and, and so cost prohibitive that, you know, all we do is here's the court decision translated. Uh, really diligent translators will go do that additional research and, and look for these things, but not everyone does. So as a result, you'll have sometimes a gap between the actual decision and the translation that follows it. Um, the, the reality is that the, if somebody is unilingual, uh, so, so they either speak English or French, how do you look at other decisions and say, is this relevant to me? So this is where tools like AI uh, of this nature becomes really handy because now you can do research a lot faster and be able to mm -hmm. consider Quebec court decisions, even, in, even if you didn't understand French, because this tool can get you something in seconds, <laughs> a court decision in seconds, whether you upload it as a PDF or whatever it may be. Uh, and it will give you a very good translation to rely on for, for the purposes of is this relevant to my case or not? Not ready to submit as an you know as, as an exhibit in court, but it's it's certainly uh, mm -hmm. good enough for the purposes of knowing is this relevant to my case or not. And it can be a way for as people are drafting this language to double check, like okay, let me think how it comes across in English, for example. You know, uh, so that's that's where this will come in really handy for practitioners, especially. Of the you know as they're referring to decisions um, and where there's only a French version of it, uh, this will be it's an extraordinary tool. I really like this idea that perfect is the enemy of good, and what you're essentially telling me is the first pass is good enough, uh, and the first pass, of course, is done by your technology by AI. It's good enough to know what the case is about, to know if the case is relevant. It's not enough for some fine um, analysis or interpretation of the case. You know, sometimes even uh, the, my brain is not enough uh, on the first pass when I'm reading in the language that I perfectly well understand. So you, I totally get your point that translation requires external sources and external um, information, ex information external to the text to achieve uh, higher quality translation. But the first pass is good enough for so many things and your software is automated because it's, it's a technology, you mentioned APIs. So you know what immediately occurs to me? Can your company provide French language head notes to Canley decisions? assuming that Canly opened its database to your company in the back end via, via an API. What will it take to accomplish that? Because this is going to be huge if it happens. It's going to be huge for thousands of French speakers in Ontario, but uh, also so many French speakers here in Canada. Uh, we could realize that within a week. <laughs> That's I mean, that's the beauty of it, because we already have a public API. It's just more investing in, in making sure we connect properly to, uh, to the Canly uh, infrastructure. And again, with the development team being in there. Uh, and not only, you know, and to, if anyone from Canly watches this, this is an open offer. Please take me up on it. We'd love to, to help with that. 
we have to put in a disclaimer that this is being done in an automated fashion, but for the sake of accessibility, et cetera, it's better to have this than not at all. And I think uh, we'd be more than happy to collaborate. This is a great offer. I recently interviewed uh, Colin Lachance, who was Canley's CEO. I will bring this uh, interview to his attention. I'm sure he has still connections with Canley. <laughs> and when you, when you mentioned uh, the, the disclaimer and this notice that uh, the translation or generation of French headnotes, for example, is automated, you know what I thought? I think uh, if my memory serves me right, and I may be wrong, I think Canley itself uses some form of uh, or automation or machine learning to generate English head notes. I don't think they actually have the editor uh, muscle like Thomson Reuters <laughs> to write head notes for themselves. I may be wrong, don't quote me on that, but yes. I think Canly, the, the point I'm making, I think Canly is technology native, they get it. That's why everybody loves Canly because they are just good with technology. So, uh, we definitely need to bring this to Canley's attention. And uh, I think this could be an example for the entire world. This is how you make bridges between communities in this country through translation. And now because of technology, we can do it quickly. You said one week, that's crazy. It blows my mind. That's unbelievable. And Pulat, you know, I, I'm going to tie to something that, that I'm very passionate about because it ties in nicely to this. I mentioned about me learning French before coming to Canada and then being somewhat disappointed that I didn't encounter it as much as I did, especially in, in a place like Windsor, you know, where you're, you're by the border with the U.S. and, and uh, there are Francophone communities there as well, but you're just not, it's not a daily occurrence, right? And then spending that uh, summer in Quebec and, and truly falling in love with the culture, the, the language, the, the history, and, and you're just like, this is amazing that we have this in our country, and yet somehow we're not as accessible as we should to each other. So part of the investment in the technology, which is now, you know, well, almost at the 20 million Canadian investment overall of pre us and after us, that, very heavy investment to, to what it was uh, to bring it to where it is today. Um, and it's, you know, the, the beauty of this is that it, it will make the Frank, Francophone Canada more accessible to Anglophone Canada and vice versa. I mean, this is what it does for, and for certain things, the good enough of, of understanding what it is, it's, it's, that's enough. And for certain things, let's say it's a company uh, that has uh, a fund company that is introducing a fund, but they're like, oh, we're not sure how much money we're raising Quebec translation costs are prohibitive. Well, now we can actually make those costs far more reasonable because if the AI does a lot of the heavy lifting, you, the human translation to follow can be done at a lower cost than it would have previously and thus making things more accessible for the Quebec market or uh, New Brunswick or wherever the, the, the Francophone communities are reading that are. Unbelievable. Uh, this can be a great project. We have to bring this to Canada's attention. We have to bring this to uh, every publisher's attention, I think. There are other publishers in Canada, in the world, and uh, I understand your technology is flexible. Uh, it, it's, it, it is probably fine-tuned for uh, Canadian languages, but uh, I'm sure that this idea can be uh, translated into, into other contexts, right? And uh, I think that's, that's the missing piece, really. At least I think in the legal community, that's the missing piece. And you're a perfect, your company is a perfect candidate to uh, bridge that gap. Thank you so much, Gary. This has been a, a, an amazing conversation. Uh, I must say, I did not uh, expect uh, that we will have this idea today and i'm really happy that we did uh, uh that's what happens when uh people who know what they're talking i'm not talking about myself i'm talking about you uh, <laughs> people who know what they're talking about uh come to this show and uh, and share their wisdom and their knowledge and their experience i'm really thankful to you and i want people who um work uh, with our publishers here in Canada to contact Gary. Uh, he's a really open person. He'll be happy to hear from you. 
and uh, hopefully something really good will come out of this. Thank you so much, Gary, for this uh, conversation today. Uh, thank you for having me, Pulat. And uh, don't, sell, don't sell yourself short, even on the Canley piece. It was your idea. I, I just filled in the gaps. <laughs> thank you, Gary. You're too kind. I appreciate it. Thank you again for having me. This has been a lot of fun.